I'd hoped to uh, make my presentation today uh, in German, but ich kann nicht Deutsch nicht sprechen too well <laughs> because I picked it up zu schnell. Uh, <clears throat> redemption. Uh, Bob Russell and I uh, will uh, overlap with each other a little bit in our presentations, and one of the things that we have noticed is that those theologians who uh, wish to bring uh, the scientific discussion into systematic theology tend to go towards the doctrine of creation. But what about redemption? And uh, in some ways, uh, we're going to pick up where uh, John Polkinghorne left us off uh, yesterday. Uh, is eschatology a player uh, in this uh, interaction and if you take a look at scientific cosmologies and what they would forecast uh, for the future, depending upon the amount of uh, mass uh, that's in the future, if, uh, if the cosmos is open, it's just going to freeze. Uh, if it's closed, it'll re-coalesce uh, into a fireball and fry. And uh, there isn't really any uh, consonance between what cosmologists say currently about the future of the universe and the biblical hope based on symbols such as new creation or the kingdom of God or resurrection or the new Jerusalem. And uh, so it's that particular dissonance between physical cosmology and uh, biblical expectations of the future uh, that I would like to uh, begin here uh, today. Uh, Bob and I, as Vim indicated, come from the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences in uh, Berkeley. Bob is the founder. Uh, about 30 years ago, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary. 10 years ago now, we started our journal uh, theology and Science, and there was some help from the Templeton Foundation at the beginning, but it's now independent and uh, growing each year. Uh, take a look at the bridge. That's the Golden Gate Bridge before it was completed. No, it's not broken. Uh, it, it was not yet completed, and Bob's vision has been, we want to see traffic going both directions, uh, from science to theology and Theology to science. Uh, the direction I'd like to go today would be what has uh, science to contribute to a theological understanding of the future and the relationship of the future uh, to the present. Uh, for a number of years, uh, we've been concerned with divine action. How is it that God works in the natural world in a non-miraculous way. We don't want to go to the miracles. Let's take a look at God in creation, God in providence, God in uh, redemption. And uh, our thought has been maturing. And Bob just uh, published uh, this book uh, recently, and he'll uh, work on time and eternity a little bit in a few minutes. Um, my own uh, position that I would like to develop before you appears in this book, Anticipating Omega, uh, published by Van den Hoek and Ruprecht. And I want to mention uh, that uh, Willem Dries here and Auntie Jacqueline and I are part of a committee that uh, watches the editing of a series that Van den Hoek and Ruprecht is doing on uh, the interaction between uh, science and theology. Um, I lay out nine principles, and no, I'm not going to give you all nine of them. I don't have enough time, but I'd like to at least deal with the core uh, proposition or a hypothesis, and that is to see God's creative work as coming from the future and not the past. And I would like to describe what I mean by that and uh, offer some uh, what I hope will be illuminating uh, ways to think about this. And I'll start with number seven, the difference between epigenetic and archonic thinking. I think the human mind has a tendency to think archonically. 
And this is a word that I've made up, and you can see the Greek word RK there. And what's curious about that little word is that it has two meanings. On the one hand, it means the beginning of something, as in our English word archaeology, or it can also mean that which governs, as in a hierarchy or a monarchy or a patriarchy. There's a natural inclination of the human mind to say the way something starts fixes its essence. So we have anniversaries and we go back and we celebrate the beginning of things. And one way to look at uh, the creation, the cosmos, is to go back at the beginning and then take a look at what happened later. Most interpretations of Genesis say, oh, that's the beginning and everything came after that. Or the Big Bang cosmology, at least our universe has a beginning and we're somewhere in the middle of its history. I call this the bowling ball theory of, of uh, uh, cosmology, namely that a bowling ball was rolled from the beginning, whether it was God or nature, and it's rolling down the alley of time, and uh, uh, we've still got the eschatological strike in front of us. Arconic thinking also assumes that the initial conditions had everything and like a seed, it's just coming to flower. Well, I don't think that's good enough. Uh, the ancient prophet Isaiah said, God's going to do a new thing. Well, if you've got a God that does new things, uh, then an arconic way of interpreting divine action isn't going to work. I prefer the epigenetic. Now, I have to define this term here. It's not the way, uh, I don't use it here as uh, has been done recently by Edward O. Wilson and others in genetics that want to talk about environmental triggers for gene expression. That's uh, not well, the way I'm using it. I want to use it the way Jan Smuts uh, used it in 1927, South African um, uh, political figure as well as biologist, wrote a book called Holism and Evolution, and he noted that in the evolutionary process uh, that there are rises to increased uh, complexity and whole organisms have a, a, a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. We use the word emergence quite a bit these days to refer to that. But what I like about the word epigenetic is not just that new things come in, but it's a powerful word. You've got Genesis in there for beginning, and then the epi is afterward or on top of. So the creative process uh, continues. And uh, Arthur Peacock uh, liked putting together creatio ex nihilo with creatio continua, and I want to follow that, and I want to say make a claim that's a little bit stronger, that the power of being God's uh, primary causation uh, comes from the future and it draws the present from what its uh, present state towards the future. Or my axiom is going to be to be is to have a future. And if we just think about it existentially, right now you and I have a present moment. The past moment has dropped off into the non-being of the past, and you and I are not who we are unless we have a next moment. To be is to have a future. I think that Heraclitus wins over Parmenides. Instead of a static being, we have a dynamic becoming, and you're in my sustaining, being sustained in existence, is due to the fact that God is every moment giving us the next moment, giving us a future. Or to think about creatio ex nihilo then, I want to say the first thing that God did was to give the world a future. That's what beginning would, uh, would be. Uh, I uh, refer to this as retroactive ontology, and there are two ways in which I want to say that the future influences, if not if it's not responsible for the very existence 
uh, of uh, physical reality. Uh, God's future is not just like our calendars might suggest, a bunch of empty boxes away from us in time, but God's future in its fullness is as close to us right now as the next moment is. And part of the impact of God's uh, future drawing of the present moment into the next moment is that God releases the present moment from the exhaustive grip of efficient causation. One of the things about the modern worldview uh, since Newton uh, is that we've tried to uh, place all of the responsibility of causation on the shoulders of efficient causation. But what we also notice about the world is that there is contingency. You can't just look at all past causes, add them up, and then predict, as you could in a clockwork, predict what the next event is going to be. There is always contingency. And then at a higher level, the meso level, we experience human freedom. An efficient causality cannot account uh, for either one of these. Maybe this is a thought experiment of the type uh, that Niels uh, is advising here. Can we think of God as contributing to the present moment by releasing the chains of efficient causality to make contingency and unpredictability possible, and then at a higher level than uh, the experience that we have as human beings in making free decisions, taking actions, and those actions consist then of contributing to the chain of efficient causality themselves. So that's the first way in which God's future acts uh, uh, on, the, on the present and uh, sustains us in existence and this particular kind of existence that we have. The second is the promise of fulfillment. We get the promise that there will be a new creation and uh, the new creation won't simply be a, an apocalyptic replacement for the present but uh, will be a fulfillment of this one. The biblical symbols are the lion lying down with the lamb or the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21. There will be no more crying or pain. And to move from those symbols to a conceptual model uh, is the task of the theologian. Consonance or dissonance. Uh, this is a, a picture I took at the uh, Heilige Geistkirche in Munich which uh, uh, I like to look at Christian symbols, and as you probably know, in the history of art, there's lots of rich symbolism for Jesus and for Mary and occasionally the Trinity, but the Holy Spirit, nobody cares about the Holy Spirit. It's an afterthought. So the best you can get is a bird. Um, well, uh, in this series of uh, paintings, uh, there is the spirit that God uses to inspire various dimensions of culture. And this one's science, the spirit of science. Um, consonance or dissonance when it comes to the theological agenda, it is an unhappy thing that I think that uh, we have to deal with a world that is understood or explained solely in terms of efficient causation, as I said, genuine contingency and freedom seem not to fit, or as we used the word emergence uh, yesterday a few times, that doesn't seem to fit either. I happen to think that the concept of emergence is more of a description than it is an explanation. And then, of course, the big one, the freezer fry cosmology doesn't uh, cohere uh, with um, the biblical promise uh, and something needs to be done about that, conceptually, I mean. One of the principles that Bob Russell appeals to quite frequently is that if God has made a promise for a transformation in the future and that the world will be different from the future than it is currently, there needs to be some precedent, uh, something in the present that will uh, lead us 
uh, over, uh, over time uh, to that conclusion. And uh, so we uh, tried to focus on the issue of Jesus' Easter resurrection as the prolepsis or the anticipation uh, in his person of the new creation that would apply uh, to the whole of reality. So right here in this room, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, we held a uh, conference on the resurrection and uh, my, Michael Velker, was along, was, along with Bob and me and many of you in this room, we're here to try to move our minds from the symbol of this promise to a workable concept of what it would mean to have a resurrection. I, I just need to say, that was a tough one. Uh, Pauline Rudd, who was here, uh, uh, among other things, said, biologically, you just can't get a coherent model of a resurrected body because bodies all live off the death of things that precede it. Remember saying that? <laughs> and uh, so um, uh, what I want to say is that we're in the middle of the task of trying to formulate a conceptual model uh, that seems to uh, provide a coherent way for looking at uh, this uh, theological hypothesis in terms of understanding um, uh, the future with a proleptic um, precedent. Well, a few other corollaries then would have to do with human nature. Uh, the human, human nature is not fully fixed yet. We are still in the becoming uh, process. We don't need to be essentialists. And we can ask, uh, can resurrection belong uh, to human nature? Karl Barth wrote a nice uh, interpretation of Romans chapter 5, Christ or Adam, and says, we ought to look at human nature not in terms of the first Adam, but in terms of the promise of the second. Uh, another correlation, our human reality is in continuity with the surrounding natural world, including uh, suffering and sin, and we did have worked on that question about the continuity of uh, human uh, sin, evil, and uh, suffering with uh, the rest of uh, the rest of nature in that regard. Uh, finally, and uh, my time is just about up, says Willem, um I want to describe God's creative activity within nature and history. Footnote. Uh, 1941, Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker writes a book called Nature as History. And I think this is good for the science and theology dialogue because theologians work in the category of history. And if we can think of nature itself as not something fixed and eternal, but as also having a history, at least we got some consonants there with which to work. God's creative activity within nature and history derives from God's redemptive work of drawing free and contingent beings into a harmonious whole. Finally, uh, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4a, why not treat it as something not archonic, but rather as epigenetic, referring to the future? Or myths in their classical sense, myths refer to the present time in light of a story about the past, but uh, why not take a take a stab at uh, treating this as a uh, forecast of the future, and God's Sabbath is yet to come. So when the world is redeemed, it will be created, and we can honestly say, behold, it is very good. Bye-bye.